This is the OGM weekly check-in call for Thursday, September 1st, 2022. Uh, turning on the transcript. Oh, good. There we go. Pete beat me to it. And um, welcome, everybody. I When I sent the invite out yesterday, I put in, I slipped in a small request, which is as we check in, because today is check-in format, to, um, to check in with a word that's uh, dear to us. And it can be a word that's dear to us long term. It can be a word that just uh, has been ringing around for us recently. Uh, it can be anything else like that. So, um, so as we go around uh, checking in, please uh, uh, offer up a word that has um, been significant for you in some way. And we'll hear a little bit about the story of why. Uh, so with that, why don't we um why don't we go uh john are you uh, and mike you have a question uh, i'm in the boston airport and i have a uh, probably 40 minutes and uh, I, I have to eat lunch in between so if i can go early that'd be good why don't we start with you and then john kelly and then klaus um Real quickly, uh, this sounds like boasting, but uh, this is leg one of the round the world Mike Nelson tour. Um, so this is uh, a stop on the way to Istanbul <coughs> and we take planes and go to Tbilisi, Georgia, where we're spending six days visiting a friend who's, who's there. Uh, and then I have to go to work and fly to uh, Singapore and Malaysia because the, the World Information Technology and Services Association is gathering about 35 of the national trade associations to cover tech. So if any of you have a message I need to deliver to those people, uh, preferably in Twitter format, uh, please send me a note. Uh, my focus is going to be on the, the, the bad memes, the bad memes that shape tech policy and, and, and business decisions bad memes like data is the new oil or you know um, hoarding is better than sharing there's a bunch of, of, of memes that are distorting our policy the, the worst one i'm worried about now is that the phone companies the, the oligopolistic phone companies in korea and europe and and the uk are trying to convince governments to get all the content creators to subsidize them because they can't make enough money providing the bits that they're getting paid to, to supply. So anyway, that's uh, that's what I'm up to for the next uh, week, two and a half weeks. Uh, also, we just released a very exciting report called Data Governance, comma, Asian Alternatives, looking at how Korea and India manage data and are trying to determine how they can make lots of money up with it. Um, combine it into new services. Um, it's an interesting time. And everybody's focusing on China, Europe, and the US, but Korea and India are doing some of the most interesting things with new business models and new new policy. So if you, if you can't find it, uh, uh, just look for uh, data governance, Asian alternatives. You are, too, you are too late to that, Mike. Pete has already sourced it and shared the link with us. Uh, well, you guys are just like so, so brainy. The other <laughs> thing, Jerry, that I need to talk to you about is that Carnegie is starting a, uh, an effort to use LinkedIn to build little communities for our, uh, particularly for some of our junior staff, our remote staff. And I'd, I'd, I'd love to know if people have found a good way to use LinkedIn rather than Facebook groups to um, build small communities you know, around fun, around research topics, around events, around job opportunities. Um, I, I, I have not done this on a, on a organization wide scale and I'm kind of the, the nudge who's pushing the idea. Um, so that's... Uh, Thanks, Mike. Uh, before I go and ask if anybody's got that kind of expertise or some experience in that, I would love to know what your word is. So I'm asking everyone to uh, jump in with a check-in with a word that means something to them. I was fascinated with that exercise. We, we just buried my uncle and at his celebration of life, everybody got one minute and one word. 
And on the back of his tombstone, we will have the words that people shared. It That's was, lovely. It's, it's quite a way. I mean, he's a very multifaceted guy, so we got a lot of weird words. But my word is a verb. Uh, just enjoy. Uh, when I bicycle or I run, I see other people, and I it's almost a command. Enjoy. <laughs> Enjoy in the affirmative or the uh, imperative, in the, something like in that. In the imperative, in the, yes, definitely in the imperative with an with an apostrophe, uh, with a uh, exclamation point after it. I love it, Mike. For the small groups, uh, one thing we've been experimenting with some of us here is Clubhouse, which is so yeah. simple for small groups. It's actually very helpful. Yeah, I mean, a lot of this is sort of information sharing and because we're a global organization by nature it will have to be asynchronous 80 percent of the time but clubhouse might be a way to build community we could we could have little clubhouse events that would let people share uh, I, I would of course welcome any ideas that people have on what to do while i'm in georgia or in singapore uh, i don't know if anybody's been to penang malaysia but i'm going to be pretty busy there but I, I uh, again, thanks, Jerry, for letting me go first. Uh, I look forward to hearing what other words people have and what other adventures people have in store this fall. Thanks, Mike, um, and happy happy trails. Uh, it appears that Mark might have, might have some advice. Uh, you're muted, but you've noticed. Years of my life are being spent unmuting, muting, unmuting, muting, unmuting, muting. We are all mutants. Yes, I, I am. <laughs> so I'm trying to um, find it, but um, in September um, in Tennessee, there's a community webs uh, meeting um, that is put on by the um, jointly by the uh, Internet Archive and groups about community webs. I will try to find that and uh, I'm trying to go to it actually. Um, uh, but uh, click on older posts and see if it's there. Um, I'm a little disheveled from uh, uh, falling in love and D-Web camp. So uh, um, if I don't get it to you immediately, forgive my not being on internet time, but on human time. What great reasons to dishevel. I mean, <laughs> seriously. <clears throat> Do you want to say a wee bit more? I mean, sorry. Do you want to say just a wee bit more? Uh, I'll, ch I'll check in. Yeah. Why don't yeah, you? Uh, I won't, I won't interrupt in. the flow. Jump, jump the queue. It seems very appropriate right now. Please do. Oh, well, I've known a woman for over four years. Um, we met at Terry Deacon's Terry and the Pirates um, group where um, we talk about. Um, how mind emerged from matter and how to basically bring the human. Uh, Terry is a biological anthropologist in neuroscience. So we study um, how mind and meaning and purpose and value emerges from matter in a physical way, not with woo woo, but with, with direct, clear physical science. It's hard. It is really, really tough, but it's the most absolutely fantastic intellectual adventure I've ever been on. Um, anyway, she, we dated and she surprised me telling me that she had this polyamorous connection with um, the guy who brought her to the group. I'm kind of like, okay, it's not for me. Years later, um, I like her as a friend. And so we go out dating. And um, uh, that was fine a little bit, you know, maybe not dating, but um, just enjoying each other's company. And then I got cancer and uh, I saw her uh, about six, seven months after uh, finishing chemo. And we ate at this marvelous restaurant owned by friends named Mua in Oakland. And I couldn't keep but jump over the table to grab her. And so, you know, I pulled back um, and knowing myself saying, yeah, this is uncomfortable for me to be repressing this kind of connection. Um, 
about four, three, four months ago, um, we started hanging out again. It was such fun. And then uh, after a while, she hits me that she's no longer with John. And I'm kind of like, okay, the brakes are off. Um, this is good. And so things accelerate. And then she hits me. She has a dom. And she's a sub. And I'm like, what? Um, let's explain this. Um, and then I get a lot of processing done with the help of ketamine and, you know, really using that drug, using that medicine to keep still and meditate. So now I'm fine with that. And then she springs on me that because of her depression, bipolar, her medicines, that she's a female eunuch and does not want any sex. And I'm going like, well, how does this fit with the, you know, I'm battered back and forth. So, um, and she's given me permission to say that all this publicly. So, you know, there's no, no, uh, no harm, no foul here. And so I'm kind of going, if I were married to this woman and this had happened to her, would I divorce her? Hell no. I'll be with, I'll be there. Next. We're sitting around my home and I have a campfire just outside my front door, which is, of course, what everybody should have. Campfires are just human to speak and just to be warm in the misty fog, to have that, you know, gradient. You're warm in front, you're cool, and, you know, there's mist outside in the dark. <clears throat> You just muted yourself accidentally, Mark. Fire is just infinitely fascinating to us humans, and it's healing. And she says, I'm fertile still. I want a baby. And I'm like Wiley E. Coyote, and here's this 10,000-foot anvil coming down on my head, smashing me into the ground. I'm in tears in seconds, and I had never even considered the possibility of having a child, much less with her, you know, for about 30, 40 years. And, and it feels like my being with her and the fire of my ardor is hurting her. So now I'm pulling back to you know, really kind of say, you know, we're at different places in life and she's in denial of some anxiety, social anxiety problems. And I think um, I'll read from John Dowland, not at the end, but a poem right now. Go crystal tears, like to the morning showers, and sweetly weep into thy lady's breast. And as the dews revive the drooping flowers, so let your drops of pity be addressed. To quicken up the thoughts of my dessert, which sleeps too sound, whilst I from her depart. Haste, <coughs> restless sighs, and let your burning breath dissolve the ice of her endured heart. Whose frozen rigor, like forgetful death, feels never any touch of my desert. Yet sighs and tears to her I sacrifice, both from a spotless heart and patient eyes. Both sighs and tears to her I sacrifice, both from a spotless heart and patient eyes. Um, Mark, thank you for, thank you for trusting us with your story. Sure. Um, I'm not sure I could have conjured up what the story you just related. Were I trying to create a work of fiction? It was fabulous. Uh, you are exactly, you are midlife 
stream of exactly that thing, experiencing it wholeheartedly in in a and and I just want to say wholeheartedly. Like I can we this may be little rectangles of zoom, but I, I feel you. Uh, and so thank you with that. Let's I think let's just go quiet for a moment. Um, and you have one more thing to add. A D webcam. 425 people who want to basically take the internet back from corporations for you know a week of my involvement. And uh, you know, I sacrificed such uh, pain, suffering to get it done. Um, fought, fought, fought so that I could bring um, this incredible piano. Um, very professional, very heavy. And people say, no, no, we don't want that. We don't need that. Turns out there was a wedding, a re-wedding of some of the most wonderful people from Yolokam, Yokum and Evie, Eva. And the piano was absolutely key in their wedding, which I had to miss um, because of some injustices done to me where I must imagine um, my innocence, basically where a woman felt harassed by me and I was not told, I was not able to be told what was going on. I just, you violated the code of conduct. We know you've done it innocently. Uh, we, but we can't tell you what's happened. We have to ask you to leave. And I'm like, I'm leaving. I wanna go to, I wanna go see Kate. I want to go get more ketamine. Gosh, I just need healing. God, I'm out of here. I've already planned to be out of here. <laughs> you know, bye. But injustice, especially towards the woman who felt violated. And yeah, there's there's things to fix. It's been one hell of a shot from a rocket week for the last three. Um, I've lost, I don't know how many pounds, but I've lost two belt sizes. <laughs> so it's kind of like... <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, I know my limits and I am able to push them to the absolute limit. Um, and I'm an Eagle Scout. I'm trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, obedient, cheerful, thrifty, brave, clean, and reverent. And you know what? I'm feeling my true self a hell of a lot more than in the past 15, 30 years. I'm feeling power and it's good. And uh, yeah, I'm done with, uh, I'm done with the uh, real difficult parts of uh, this last month or two. And I'm here, I'm back. So I hope to uh, listen and uh, more deeply participate in this group as many other groups that I'm with. Thank you for listening. Um, don't mean to have a long check-in, but, uh, you know, if it felt appropriate, um, try to keep it as concise, clear, and respectful as possible. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. And, and welcome back to yourself. Yeah. Um, oh, one thing that is really, really important. I thought I was head sick or that I had some kind of body sickness, but I discovered from healing and accelerating the healing with many different paths that for many years I've been heart sick. And I, did, I don't know that path to healing, but it's doable and it's necessary. And I'm taking the first steps on that path to heal that heart sickness. Kate may not be right. Most of my friends say, she's a hot mess, run away screaming. Um, but you know, that's my decision, her decision. We'll see if, uh, yeah, it's, it's, I've been in love with other people. And uh, if this doesn't work, then I'm not going to hurt her and I'm not going to hurt me trying to make it work like I used to. Thanks. That was important to say. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Um, I don't know how any of us are going to follow what you just said, but I know that John Kelly was at D-Web Camp as well and reported in briefly for us from the field. <clears throat> uh, so why don't we go John Klaus, uh, Doug Carmichael. Okay. Good um, luck, Tom. Good luck. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. 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 A hard act to follow is sort of an understatement. Um, 
I will say, uh, let's see. Well, I, I'll, I'll do the word first. And it's a word we've all heard and we've all used. And I have a, I am using it because I have a new appreciation of how fragile it is. And, and, the, and the word is sense-making. And um, as it relates to the D-Web, um, well, that's the reason why I was there. Uh, I was there to uh, find out what people were doing to enhance and preserve sense-making and what the risks were and what else was going on. And uh, I spent almost all the time in a group called Metagov, which is focused on governance. And they've been working on this for quite a while. Uh, one of the slightly disturbing aspects of that is that they are thinking the way internet engineers have to think, which is, you know, pipes and and interfaces and and you know the they're they're, they're actually trying to build a new set of things that true they don't they want to get past the current uh agramulations or whatever you want to call them you know the things that allow platforms to become corporate and and to dominate uh and that involves you know identity and reputation and all kinds of other things but but they're really focused at this point on on quite technical at least a lot of them, a, a, a bunch of them are focused on quite technical, I mean, what we could call content-free. <coughs> and I'm, of course, and several other people there are focused on content. I mean, we're, we're exactly focused on, wait a minute, what is it that allows, disallows, or encourages people to um, discover things, to make sense, and to make a different sense than they're being led to make by it's what's worse much worse than a filter bubble bubble it's, it's by the very active um distorting powers um that are out there um so it was a it was a very good week i'm, I'm very glad i was there uh we had lots of good conversations um it's uh it was not i would say it was about it was partially reassuring and partially um, disconcerting uh, because of the range of, like I say, the range of where people want to put emphasis on their uh, their efforts. Um, and from my personal perspective, and which I think might be shared by OGM, that, that we would have said, well, there's not enough emphasis on um, the the positive, not just content, but the positive in infrastructure, you know, the kind of okay, maybe it's not uh, uh, Braver Angels, maybe it's, you know, there's there's various things that we all know about that we think of are, you know, going in the better direction, even if they haven't found it yet. And um, there was, I would have wished there was more emphasis on that. And, and I intend to try to do more of that in the future uh, with the people and with the contacts that I made. But that's sort of like the, the way the battle line is is drawn now. Lots of interesting stuff. You know, if, if people are interested, we could we could drill deeper. Um, and <coughs> found out about Holochain, which I didn't fully understand before. And I'm, you're shaking your head, Jerry. I'm sure you're you're more up to speed on it. I'm I'm a I'm a huge fan, and I love Arthur and, and all the things he's done. But I'm not at all up to speed on it, so I'm I'm curious. Yeah. yeah. So you know that that's a topic for a future. A future session and and maybe broad it's it should be broader than um d web it should be <coughs> what are the positive what what are the threats to sense making and what are the positive uh sources directions resources both technical as in you know from d web and also from other other places uh about that it's a possible future topic um, thank you thanks john that's that's awesome um, let's go to Klaus, uh, Doug, Carmichael, and Stacy. Uh, Mark has his hand up briefly. Go ahead, jump in. You're still muted. There you go. I have a ritual for uh, acknowledging that mistake. <laughs> I have a crush. Yeah, anyway, a training, right? Um, yeah, I want to thank John for showing up at my talk. And uh, um, 
it started slowly and uh, uh, and then it was attended by some amazing people, um, uh, including an artist uh, that uh, Natalia Jeremjenko, who is uh, this one of my heroes or sheroes, as you'd say. So uh, that was that was just amazing um, and appropriately small and short. <laughs> so thank you, John, and thank you for uh, you know the talks that we had. They were deep and wonderful. All right, love that. Um, thank you. Let's go, uh, Klaus. Next. Yeah, the word <clears throat> the word that I come across most often and use most often is regenerate, and that's because of my single minded focus. But regenerate, regeneration, regenerative, and it is in in contrast to sustainable, um, because we are beyond focusing on sustainable because the systems, the natural systems have deteriorated to a point where we need to fix them first before we can return back to a sustainable world. So regenerative means to repair. And you see that, um, you see that taking hold when you look at, for example, the Regenerate America initiative, um, which which seeks to 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 help understand the the need to uh, to repair what is a depleted environment and to restore our relationship with the natural world. So that's in a very short nutshell here. What uh, what word came to mind for me? Thanks, Klaus. Uh, anything else you'd like to check in with? Well, <clears throat> the yeah, I mean, I see, um, I see a lot of of uh, energy and activity in this regenerate regenerative uh, community. What I don't see much of is it leaking and taking hold in the general public. Um, there is still an astonishing disconnect between where we are and what uh, what direction we need to take and um, and the understanding of the general public, what that implies. So I've been working in my own community to, to get people interested to take a look at the IRAD, no, the, the um, Inflation Reduction Act, because there are, for example, $20 billion in there to restore local watersheds and uh, repair soil in, in, in a hyper-local context. And even in a relatively progressive community like Bend, they, it just doesn't resonate. You see a few people who get it, um, but by and large, the local paper doesn't pick up on it. The... Uh, uh, even the NGOs that are operating here locally don't get it. And it's it's sort of, I mean, you you just feel uh such such heartache you now to to try to figure out how to explain the the urgency of of uh, of the moment when you look around uh, globally. Uh, I mean one third of Pakistan is underwater. I don't know if you have followed this, right? They lost ninety percent of their crop already because the the river that runs through the entire country from from the north to south uh, covers one third of the land mass, and of course all the crops are being grown next to the river. Now, and that kind of flooding has wiped out their crop. Europe has lost you know, about fifty percent of their yields. Here in the United States, the same China has has lost massive amounts of crops and so on, and still. Um, you know, when you look at what we're focusing on in our national dialogue, it just doesn't penetrate into public consciousness. And it's so irresponsible and reckless of uh, people who control the media to not educate and alert the public to uh, the implications of that, because they are, it, 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 it has to be a collective response right there is nothing that a few companies no matter what size can fix uh, it, it requires behavioral adaptations and changes you know we need to mitigate and adapt so we are in an adaptation mode so 
yeah i'm sort of in this uh i mean i you know i have people who want to uh, you know start a company and, and you know engage uh i just gave a presentation at an industry forum which uh, has piqued quite some interest in the in the systems thinking network but um the 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 systemic connections you know between between uh, our individual behavior and the uh, response in the uh, uh, food production and natural world in general um, are just are just not visible you know, to the general public. And I don't know how the where this is going, and I don't know how much longer we feel drifting along here uh and and fixing uh you know whatever donald trump wants to do uh is uh is possible you know without having uh some some real bad times uh ahead of us so it's like you're sitting in a car speeding towards a wall you know and you're trying desperately to can we shift that steering wheel just a little bit to the left or the right but we can't you know sorry i didn't mean to uh beyond my usual rant, but it, it's getting more depressing you know, the longer it keeps rolling. Um, thanks, Klaus. Uh, there will be counselors available in the hallway after our call today. Um, yeah, it's a, these are these are very really trying times. Thank you for that. Uh, let's go Doug Carmichael, Stacy Pete. Uh, Jerry asked why I was wearing a scarf and it's 47 degrees here this morning on the Russian River in Northern California. And we've had great weather despite what's going on in the world. My word, um, I was looking with Jerry's nudge here on what word stirs up the most number of neurons in my mind? Uh, what, what's the resonance? Uh, and the word that I come up with too, uh, and neither are very pretty. Well, maybe the second one's okay. But the first, which is the most stimulating to me, is the word art. Uh, and I looked up at the etymology of art, and it also is related cognately to uh, arms, as in weapons, which shows everything is more complicated than we think. Uh, what's been on my mind mostly is uh, given temperature rise and things like Pakistan. A uh, question that I played with a lot is who will do what and when will they do it? Uh, anyway, I'm just going to stop there. Um, thanks, Doug. What was the second word that was coming up for you? Oh, good. I never got there, did I? No. no. <laughs> uh, unconscious. Oh. Thank you. Um, Thanks, Doug. Let's go Stacy, Pete, Judy. Well, if it's okay, I'd really like to give my time to Erica. I know it's her first time here and um, Ken invited her. I'll very quickly tell you that my word is cottywampler, which I got from April's book. And I love that word because finally I found a word to describe myself. Um, and the only other thing I wanna share is that um, I hosted a really nice call between Barry and Julian on my drop-in hours that I put up on the channel that Pete started in Mattermost. I think it's really interesting call. And that's it. And welcome, Erica. <laughs> I'm sure that's okay with everybody that I'm giving her my time, right? Um, yes. And, and Stacy, thank you. I had, uh, with, with somebody who's new to the group, I usually put them sort of in the middle of the flow. I'm happy to, Erica, bring you in at this point. That'd be great. Um, so if you'd like to jump in, please feel free. Sure. Thank you, Stacey. I appreciate that. Um, and welcome. Thank you. It's great to be here. I, um, I, yeah, Ken invited me and it's, it's wonderful to be here. Um, so starting in with my word. Um, yeah, I think right now it's explore. <laughs> so I'm exploring different things actually in my personal life and in different communities. Um, a little bit about what I do. Um, I do, um, uh, organizational development, leadership development, top team alignment journeys. Um, I work with a lot of C-suite folks to help them transition from role to role conversation to human to human conversation. And I understand from Ken that probably a lot of you all uh, are involved in 
organizational development. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, I also focus on, um, <laughs> exactly, Jerry. <laughs> um, Timothy, is it possible? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> um, I also focus a lot of my work on diversity and inclusion and um, helping companies build practices and processes that are equity centered. Um, it's kind of been a place where I'm probably experiencing the most friction and at this point in my career. Um, I think uh, there's, so just a little bit of background on me. Um, I'm first generation US, um, my family's from Mexico. Um, I typically get told by a lot of people that I don't look Mexican, um, which, um, which is a whole interesting conversation to have <laughs> about, um, about um, what our media and what our society tells us a certain ethnicity should look like. Um, and I'm just encountering a lot, of, um, a lot of conversations in my career right now where the diversity inclusion principles aren't really getting up applied what dare I say appropriately or regeneratively I, I love that word and it concerns me it concerns me because it's um, um, it's impacting the way we're doing business it's impacting who we're bringing in to do work who we're not bringing in to do work it's impacting the way we relate to each other as humans um, and what I find in the work that I do is that a lot of times the the technical piece, the analytical piece is there, the wisdom is there, but what gets in the way are the feelings and the emotions and, um, and the lack of safety that one feels in the group. So that's what's coming up for me in this, um, in this part of my time and this part of my journey. Um, also, um, just to kind of share a little bit more with you about um, what Explore means to me. I'm I'm usually nerding out and reading a bunch of books and designing things. And I'm in this place in my life where I'm just kind of leaving the computer I'm taking art classes. I'm taking rowing classes. Um, I'm doing open water swimming and I'm reconnecting with what I call the better half of my brain. So I'm hoping that brings some peace and some rewilding of the mind to bring in some more creative and love-based solutions. So that's me. <laughs> Erica, thank you so much and welcome. Uh, really happy you're here and, and love your quest. It's really great. Yeah. <laughs> and and there seems to be this theme of reconnecting with ourselves, our essences, our other our other parts, our other less linear, brainy, whatever mm -hmm. parts, which is lovely. That's great. Thank you. Um, Pete, Judy, Julian. Um, thanks. Uh, heavy call so far and especially thanks mark for for being human and not just internet that's awesome um my word is uh my word is love uh and this has been my word uh in some of the the get-togethers that jerry's had probably for 20 years or so um it's a little bit harder to say it nowadays. Um, it feels like the world has changed from, you know, 10 or 20 years ago. It's a different world. Um, uh, I still think it's the most important word, kind of, or the most important concept, maybe. Words, words aren't so important, but maybe, you know, the idea underneath it is. So um, all we need is love. Um, love is what, what puts us together. So um, I still like the word. I wish the world were different around it. Um, I just have maybe a really quick check-in, um, all kinds of interesting stuff going on, uh, including my explorations into, I, I feel s <laughs> silly, stupid even saying this, but, uh, my explorations into AI, uh, art and, and image generation, um, the space is exploding, um, and that doesn't mean that you have to go check it out. It's not an interesting space, I think, for most people. Um, most people are like like visual arts um, or you know engage with visual arts, um, but maybe not um, to to get into AI image and, and art stuff. <clears throat> you have to have uh, kind of a professional interest, um, which I kind of known I've had for a while. 
Um, anyway, uh, I'm going to put uh, a, a link to the MetaMost channel I started. Um, it's a small channel. It's not very active yet, but you can kind of keep touch with where I'm exploring. And um, I'll hope to have more news in a few weeks. Love that, Pete. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, Judy Julian. I'm going to try two words. <clears throat> One is kind of odd in the sense that it's hope. Um, there's a lot to not feel hopeful about in the world right now. And yet there are people of substance who are attempting to address things that seem unaddressable. And as the movement spreads, I think that there's a possibility that things could improve. And so I choose to be hopeful. Um, the second word is generative. And that's because I think a lot of organizations that at least I'm working with are beginning to actually think differently about what the issues are and what in ever, whatever level, small to big, they might be able to do. There's a, a movement or a sense of a possible movement toward action to change things. And if that can be expanded, if people can kind of take it to heart and bring it to the next meeting they go to and ask similar questions, it's heartening to hear collective groups of individuals asking tough questions, trying to figure out what the issues are and what they might do to try to address those issues. Thank you. Um, there does seem to be some interesting kind of shift afoot in lots of different ways and corners. And I'm just, my spidey sense is sort of saying that there's some kind of a groundswell orientation shift, polar switch. I don't know what exactly to call it, but something's going on that's big. So thanks for pointing to that as well. Uh, Julian Michael Berry. So I still feel inadequate going after Mark. Um, but my first word is relief. In the last couple of days, I've actually been able to get some work done. And th these days, I spend most of my time putting out fires. So it felt really good to be wading into various software packages and, and getting some uh, knowledge developed. Um, my second word is actually a word pair. It's both anticipation and dread. So they sort of cancel each other out. Anticipation because of a conference coming up week after next. And then uh, dread after Klaus's observation as to what's happening with flooding and the way that the world's media is just is basically ignored. Well, the US media is ignoring it. And one thing I've got to point out is that, for example, the UK media seems to be giving doing a better job covering what's going on in Pakistan than the US media is. Um, okay, so those are my words. Awesome. Anything else you want to check in with? Uh, this conference coming up week after next is called Dent. It's uh, named after Steve Jobs' observation about put a dent in the universe. And as you know, my goal is to take over the world. Uh, although at my age, I don't remember what for, but uh, the basic premise is to try to improve communication between people. And having taken some real positive steps toward that in the last two days, then it, it makes me feel good for now at least. So. Uh, is this the dent? Is it Steve Brobeck's dent? Yes. Okay, cool. Um, thank you very much. Um, <laughs> Michael Lynn Berry. Um, I, I came in a little late, so I'm, I'm picking up what the, the word is, is supposed to represent. I, I wasn't here for the, the, um, the challenge. Um, and I think the word kind of word set that is alive for me is understanding and misunderstanding, um, therefore, and just the, the crucial nature on a personal level, on a group level, on a global level um, of being able to, you know, stand under somebody else's condition and and empathize and and grok what what is making them behave the way they do and and not not simply you know misunderstand it seems 
misunderstand seems too benign a word for the act of not standing under somebody's um, conditions. I mean, it's it's really active. It's an active, willful thing to to not understand, to not empathize, um, and at the same time, we can all do better in in helping people understand where we're at um, instead of assuming that you know we're right and you know just coming from a place of work around me you know work around my way of being my stance um so yeah that's that's what i'm thinking about um on a lot of levels thanks michael um, thanks. Go ahead. um there's a a really interesting difference that i don't think is explored that much between disinformation misinformation malinformation and uh there's an uh, misunderestimation, just to do a little Bushism, uh, of the power of people who intentionally want to disrupt discourse. I call it denial of discourse attacks, uh, where we're trying to figure out how to solve some stuff, but there's some actors in the arena who are actively trying to make sure nobody's got time to actually solve the problems. Uh, and that turns into all sorts of spin and manipulations. We've talked about that on lots of, lots of uh, OGM calls before. And, and I continue to have this naive belief that we can find some place to meet and talk about these things with people who believe very differently from us, despite that mal-information, that poor, in, that very different intention coming in. So uh, it's, on, it's on my mind a lot. Uh, Merchants of Data is a fabulous book. Jerry, I just, I just want to cut back in just to um, yeah, please. kind of create... Um, while I totally agree with what you're saying, I want to create some some distance between the mis and disinformation and the and the you know understanding piece that I feel like the the empathy and love and um, and feeling of somebody else's position, let alone you know putting aside the content that drove them there, the content that you, you know, I, I think that that misinformation and disinformation are sometimes, but not always, symptomatic of misunderstanding, not the thing that leads to the to the misunderstanding. Um, and and so and I, I I do think that when you talk misunderstanding these days, one goes to, oh, blame the misinformation and the disinformation and the malinformation. Um, and, you know, I'd, I'd love to see us all individually try and move past that. Um, so, Thank yeah. You. Thank you. I love that point. I appreciate it. Um, Mark, you have a hand up. Um, yeah. Um, thank you, Michael. That's an amazing point. Um, I try to find my role in you know many different groups and i think of what i've been doing for many many years is as a reverse epistemologist i think that epistemological justification is bunk people basically conflate knowing with belief and what people believe is what they want to believe and so I look at the aesthetics of wanting, of desire, and where it comes with belief. But reverse epistemology is also looking at ignorance, also looking at a closed heart, saying, I don't want to hear you. I don't want to know. And to melt those indirect, as Dowland puts it, hearts, um, yeah, I think that's our job. Our job is to be more human and set a better example and say, hey, we're having fun. We're talking. We're, we're connecting. We're, we're basically loving each other without being assholes to each other. And you're invited. Come join the fun. Come join the fun of being more open, more listening, 
more connected, more compassionate. And um, yeah, I think it's it's our hearts that it's got to lead, um, not our brains. Although we're we're hella smart here. I I respect every damn person on this call for their intelligence, clarity, thoughtfulness. Um, but it's the heart work. Boy, it's the heart work. And I just don't have a clear path to that. But I think my role is shaman. To know love, sex, drugs, and death really, really well. And um, to basically um, be mm, secretly a shaman. Because a shaman gains power with, with more people who know that they, he or she, is a shaman. And they don't share that. If you share that, the shaman loses power. Um, so I'm trusting all of you to not tell anybody, <laughs> even though this is uh, going to be a recording. <laughs> you're, but you're... it's also being, you know, it's also being in the in the middle, being between worlds. Um, I'm Mexican, half Mexican. Um, I can pass for white. I can pass for male. I can pass for old. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, yeah, Michael inspired that push to being heart leaders rather than you know trying to get attention for ourselves for our smarts and thus get some kind of how do you say brand or personal brand such that we are able to survive more easily because of people wanting to give us money for our our our, our expertise it's kind of a both end there and i don't know that path but again i think it's doable and i think it's necessary thanks thanks mark and your shamanic secret is safe with us it's just between us um us and the two ferns <clears throat> i think witch doctor might be a hell of a lot more fun to uh, <laughs> uh but you know i think a lot of people would get uh, offended by that it's yeah. kind of a uh, there's also the trickster and the green man those are very fun archetypes um, Barry, Doug B, Carl. Well, I just have about three minutes because I have to jump to a noontime meeting. Oh, sorry, sorry about that. I would have brought you in earlier. Uh, it's oh. okay. I don't really have that much to say. Um, the other meeting, which meets every Thursday at noon, sometimes we meet in person and I can't even be here because I have to travel uh, beforehand to get there. Today we're meeting on Zoom, so I've got like a couple of minutes before that meeting. Um, I did write down two words which are my own, and then a third word which I added from what I heard. The two, idea, the two words that get me going are idea and enthusiasm. And in my career, whenever I assigned to a, address a hard problem, the first thing is come up with an idea that has some promise and generates enough enthusiasm to work out the idea to see if it, if it can really solve the problem. And that's really what my professional career has been about. About 35 years ago, I had what I consider to be maybe the best idea of my career and the most enthusiasm. And that, what, that led to some research on the role of emotions in learning. And I ended up developing a systems theoretic, technical mathematical model of the interplay of emotions and learning, which I wrote up as <clears throat> um, peer reviewed and encyclopedic articles on cognition, affect, and learning. And I would, my, my great dream is to pass that work on to a successor while they're, before the hourglass of life runs out on me. And I'm, I'm in search of somebody who's interested in that work and wants to pick up where I left off. The other word that I um, spend more time on these days is misconception. There are so bloody many misconceptions that um, suffuse our popular culture. And as a scientist and as an educator, it's part of our role to dispel misconceptions. And that turns out to be bloody, bloody hard, much harder than I ever imagined it would be. So that's, that's the short and long of it. I hate to eat and run, but I'll stick on for about a couple more minutes, then I got to bail. 
Thanks, Barry. I just shared a link in the chat asking if that was a piece of the work and Stacy confirms it. I just want to see if you have any other links you'd like to share on that so that we can go investigate. Uh, yeah, that's the one on cognition effect learning. And as Stacy mentioned, I spent uh, an hour or so last Monday uh, with Julian Gomez and he and I have, turns out, have a, a lot of overlap of interests and a background and we had never met before. So there's hopefully going to be a, a rich exchange, but uh, I've only had one hour with Julian so far. So the dendrites have connected. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Judy, it's dendritic interactions at play. Um, let's go, Doug, Breitbart, Carl, and Rick. Um, well, first, Mark, I just want to acknowledge your generosity and share. It was awesome and uh, appreciate it. Um, so the word for me is, is connection uh, or the lack thereof. And uh, um, I'm really interested in how to restore that on a sentient whole being basis um, while creating doing. Um, and uh, there are just two pieces of, uh, of that that I think are striking commentary. Uh, my partner in Germany, Tina Gotterman, is involved with a volunteer organization that is uh, responsible for uh, shepherding the Kogis through a European swing. I don't know whether everybody here is familiar. They're an indigenous tribe. Um, and um, they send emissaries, teams, uh, out into the world. Um, to sort of share their experience in the world. And Tina shared with me uh, the first step of their journey on this particular trip was a flight from uh, Latin America to, to Europe. And the first thing that was required in order for them to fly, because they do not wear shoes anywhere ever, um, is that they could not board a plane without wearing shoes. And so it was a shot of them in a big box store getting all outfitted with shoes. But uh, intrinsically shoes disconnect them from the earth. Like, so in order for you to come to our world, um, the first thing we're gonna do is disconnect you from the earth, which is all about the center of where they live from, how their belief system, you know, they, they're completely and fully integrated 24 seven in being connected to and part of the natural world and the planet and the universe. So that was, that was uh, piece one. And piece two was a tweet that uh, was the man who married a hologram in Japan can no longer communicate with his virtual wife. The software that allowed the interaction is no longer supported and the man can no longer interact with the hologram with which he had a relationship for years. And um, between those two things, it sort of captures at least for me, um, where have we gone wrong? Like, where have we lost um, discernment about what's important on a living human being basis? And um, so uh, I'm working on the white wolf of that, which is how to um, how to reconnect and restore and create space and possibility for people to reconnect internally with their own beingness and then with their world and with each other. And uh, I'm complete. Thanks, Doug. 
Thank you. Um, Carl, Rick, and me. So yeah, I, I posted a few links and um, over the past week and I went to a workshop and the um, themes were about dignity, trust, and belonging. And um, my um, day job where I'm, oh, there's the um, DEI, but the federal government, we actually, it's actually DEIA accessibility. So it's really nice having that, that um, being explicit in there. So I've spent, spent over a decade having to be the accessibility evangelist. So it's nice that <laughs> we've, um, made progress on that front. But um, yeah, there's a just how um, belonging, and I've seen um, some things where people are bringing belonging to DEI, and then um, and then also the, this dignity though, it was, um, her talk was fascinating because um, her and another um, speaker was, it's about, it was about um, conflict, conflict resolution and things too, and the international things, working with um, Bishop Tutu and um, things. It's dignity was the word that came out that people felt their dignity was being violated and stuff. That that connected uh, more with people than any of the other words that um, people had. So she's, uh, uh, Dr. Hick has um, two books on it, so. So that's kind of what's got my attention this week. So, Carl, is, is your word dignity or word or accessibility? Yeah, or dig had a yeah digni dignity. And if a uh, second one would be belonging. Thank you. And thanks for the book recommendations as well. Um, I didn't know about Donna Hicks and her work, so more stuff to learn about. Uh, Rick, you are up. Sorry about that. My no phone was my phone was going off. Um, yeah, m my word is um, uh, equity moonshot, um, and I just want to what what it, what it means is uh, it, it's about co-designing and building an equitable, regenerative, and sustainable future. That's the definition. And I I was doing a course this week, and I, there was an assignment, an accountability assignment, which had to come up with a promise about what your work is about. What are you promising to deliver? And I found that incredibly instructive. And so I wrote something up and it so happened that I'm, I'm gonna be submitting an abstract to a conference in the beginning of November. Uh, it's a small international uh, conference of complexity scholars in healthcare. Um, and I, I shared it with the, the person who's organizing the conference just to get his feedback because he's from Australia and he has such a different lens and it was incredibly instructive because he didn't like the word equity moonshot. Um, and I didn't define it in my abstract. And so I thought I had to define it, uh, which I did. And I told him uh, what, you know, how to redress his negative connotation because it's a technological metaphor. But equity moonshot to me is an oxymoron because it's both technical and equity has to do with humanity. So what I thought I would do is just share the abstract with you. I'm not going to read it, but I just share it. In the, and, and if anybody's interested, I'd be delighted to connect. Um, I'm hoping to, to launch a course at the beginning of 2023, what I'm calling the 100 Day Equity Moonshot Quest, um, which is about uh, how to develop big, hairy, audacious questions that challenge our mindsets. So that's my little update and I'll put the abstract in and if anybody wants to connect through, I don't know sure if I can fit it in because it, there may be some limit to the size that you can put the text box. I may have to break it up into small little segments. Okay. I'm Rick and I'm done speaking. Uh -huh. Does it exist uh, online in some place? Um, I'm going to I'm going to put it in as a LinkedIn uh, article, but I, I, I've just got a few people that I want to run it by first and then um, okay. it'll probably come out on Monday. But I'll, I'll just put little segments of it in and break it up that way. Thanks. And Pete found and put the link to your LinkedIn post about Equity Moonshot in the chat. So that's already in there. Okay. Well, that's great. The, okay. Thank you.
And could you, just as an example, like what does an equity moon shot look like, smell like, taste like? Um, well, it, the definition, uh, as I mentioned, is about co-designing and building an equitable, regenerative, and sustainable future. And the reason why equity is at the forefront of the virtues there is because our systems are designed for inequities. Uh, and as long as we are living in a ne neoliberal world, we're not going to change that. And so if we're going to shift towards uh, a regenerative, ecological, economic, and energy renewal, renewable systems, then we're going to have to completely flip our, our economic paradigm, which is incredibly difficult to do. Um, so it's really about um, how to cultivate meta-thinking about how to design our systems. Um, and in that article, there are five layers of big, hairy, audacious questions, and I invite people to add their own, starting the meta, macro, meso, micro, and nano, which is, which is to do with uh, intra-being. And uh, I, I appreciated Mark's uh, authentic being at the beginning because he was speaking from the heart for, from his inter-being, and that is something that is critically important if you're going to, in turn, uh, influence how we think at a meta level. So it's how to take a holistic uh, ecological approach to this, if that makes sense. Thank you. I think it does. Uh, I appreciate the, the added clarity. Uh, Mr. Friend, thanks for joining us. I, and uh, it's you then me. Hi. Um, hi, everybody. Sorry for being late. At the and, and I've been asking everybody to put one word into the conversation that has been on their mind, either long-term or in the last five minutes, but something significant. So we've had a bunch of really interesting different words come through. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. I was wondering on the context that I had stepped into. Um, um, I came in when Carl was talking about dignity and dignity has been a word that's been alive for me lately. In particular, <clears throat> I may have talked about this before, um, uh, in a conversation where people were talking about their great anger at all that's wrong in the world today, um, a friend of mine said, no, no, you're not angry, you're indignant. And I, I loved what, what, what that stone thrown into that pond, I loved the ripples that came from that because it felt in, in indignation um, uh, and a sense of the violation of dignity felt like a much more powerful place to stand than standing in anger. Uh, and I'm glad to hear the echoes of Bishop Tutu and others in there. So I, I, I think that's a, 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 it's a, it's a rich word for us to explore. Um, give me a moment. So the, the other one word for me these days is serenity and how to, which is the challenge of how to be serene in the face of all the turmoil that we're living in, which I don't anticipate it's going to end anytime soon. Um, and um, I know people who, who are um, intensely buffeted in their moods by the events of each particular day. Like are the headlines this morning good or headlines bad and their mood for the whole day is set by that. And so I'm in a practice to, to not deny or ignore any of that stuff, but to sail the stormy seas with a much more even keel. So serenity. Be my here. Thanks, Gil. Um, I like the word equanimity, which is sort of uh, similar yeah. to it. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, and uh, this is going to be a, a funny, a funny thing maybe to to join this with. But I think this the concept became a little clearer for me years ago when I was talking with a friend a really long time ago, a colleague, and he talked about going to his first uh, paintball match and uh, how like his nerves were like, he was like, like really, really sort of jittery and nervous and how at some point somebody just sort of walked up to him and ping, shot him like right there because he was busy like reloading and trying to figure out whatever. And, and, and he, the conversation was something about how just being calm in that stressful situation allowed you to sort of move slowly and the Navy SEALs say slow is smooth, smooth is fast. Uh, that, that presence of mind, equanimity, serenity, whatever that is in moments of crisis is pretty, I think, crucial for being able to respond and stay centered and you know be good in an emergency because otherwise 
Otherwise, you're just adding to the emergency because you wind up slipping into crisis yourself, and then we need to figure this out for you. Um, Gil mentions we know this in martial arts. My martial art is Aikido, and there are moments in Aikido where you're doing a really difficult and interesting move, and you're in the middle of chaos because everybody on the mat around you is doing the same move, and you're trying not to hit them, never mind you know throwing and being thrown, and you get this sense of, oh, like things are really in motion, and I kind of know where I am in the motion, and I'm participating in the motion and helping it move along, and it's a beautiful kind of uh, coordinated feeling. Uh, Mark. Um, so I'm a Orange County punk from the 80s. Go OC. Yeah. Um, Me too. Me too, by the way. Marina High School. Really? What high school? Marina High School, Huntington Beach. No. Yeah. Did you know Laura Baker? Good Lord, no. They, I, my, my graduating class was 995 kids. Are you kidding me? No, 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 no. I mean, uh, gosh, that was like my first real, real sort of wanting to have kids and relationships. Oh, my God. Yeah, no, I know I, lots I of might people. I might have crossed paths with her. We're, we're yeah, sort no, of I, I went to University High in Irvine. And I went to UCI my whole four years undergrad. I went to UCI as a senior in, uh, in, uh, in, in 1980. That's that crazy. Nice. Yeah, it was it was fun. Um, anyway, um, so as a punk, um, uh, Janet, um, who is just so lovely, uh, lost my virginity to her, um, uh, basically um, had a dad with sayings. And one of his sayings was, life isn't fair, but it is short. Um, and uh, I'm kind of reflecting on Gil's notion of serenity. And Janet would say, I don't wear clothes as a costume. I wear them as a disguise mm -hmm. to, to fool people. Um, and serenity can be used for that uh, while the heat, the inner heat of indignation boils and gives you energy. But you, know, you, you hide that and you just kind of come with serenity in your interface with the others. It's, it's a thought. I like that thought. I like that thought a lot. Thanks, Mark. Um, and uh, Gil. I'll just add one more. I like that a lot, Mark. I I indignation is not something to be thrown about all the time. It's to be used very selectively. And yeah, and like you say, you know, held within in a way and let out in certain times in certain ways. Yeah, nicely put. Um, Indignation is also kind of a tactical weapon and uh, has been wielded incredibly well by the rising far right. Mm -hmm. And there's a thought in my brain now about Democrats finally getting pissed about stuff. And it, it has a, links to a couple of YouTube recordings of uh, the woman from Wisconsin or Minnesota from the local uh, house who got really mad at a woman who took out an ad calling her a groomer and a bunch of other stuff. And then Joe Biden, strangely enough, just in the last week, has started to show some, uh, I don't know exactly what we shall call it here, but some spine, perhaps, uh, and is, is coming out in a way that's really different from his normal tone and, and, and manner, even though it looks a lot like his normal tone and manner, but it's different. And that's really interesting because indignation properly applied uh, also attracts attention and, and becomes a, a bit of a motive force. Um, if anybody hasn't seen the the Joe Biden um, viral, um, you know, is releasing his indignation about Republicans claiming to be the party of law and order, mm -hmm. and at the same time being fine <laughs> about cops being killed by Donald Trump's ego um, leading people, um, I highly recommend it. There's also the dark Brandon meme, which is quite interesting um, and kind of love, a lovely twist on things. Um, so I'm, I'm going to cheat a tiny bit on my word uh, because I want to sort of put a couple words in the conversation. Anybody who's been to my retreats knows that my word almost consistently was intent, and that is still a hugely important word for me. And then my recent work uh, seems to be a lot about memory. Like, why don't we have a better memory? How do we build a shared memory? Uh, how do we forget things so quickly? How do we adapt so quickly to terrible circumstances or systems? Uh, all those kinds of things. And then this shift that I perceive that we're going through. So I was sort of getting the shift. And then I realized, um, I realized that my word needs to be focused right now because I am so distracted by everything that's going on and that 
I'm having a really hard time just staying on the path and doing the things that need to get done day to day. Uh, and so I think my word is focus um, because I lack it. I am, I'm eminently excited about everything. These conversations spin me up like you wouldn't believe. Uh, I have a, you know, 10 tabs open in my browser, which I will go harvest and collect up to attach to the notes, to download the video, to upload that and, and like off and off to the races uh, for, for what we've done here, not to mention some of the new things that, that you all have offered into the conversation as ingredients in the, in the stew. Um, and, and somehow in amid those words is uh, the thing I would love to figure out how to build or do for how to use my life energy around here, which is um, how to collimate the energies of people who have similar kinds of wishes and desires and aspirations, um, how to come in and, and do that. Uh, yeah, no, you don't want to see my browser. It's got more than 10 tabs open. The 10 tabs are new ones from this particular call. I mean, there are way too many tabs open in my browser, just in case you were worried that I was actually achieving some browser discipline. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, don't don't worry about that. Um, so anyway, that that's kind of where I am, and uh, and um, I, I'm no physicist, but laser is collimated light. It's basically light brought into uh, synchronous frequencies so that it has more energy and can burn a hole or melt something or do whatever else. Um, and so I think of it as collimation of human energies and human intentions in some very intangible way. I think that's that's a, a piece of this is like, how do you stand in a series of, of waves and ripples and act like a Pacific Island navigator, understand the swells and what they mean in terms of what land masses they're bouncing off of and where the prevailing winds and currents are and what other energies are actually in the waters. Uh, because, and this I'm sort of taking from Aikido, uh, how do you blend with the energies that are in the waters to redirect them toward a better outcome? One of the nice things about Aikido is that it's a defensive martial art, um, and there's no, there's no, there's no Aikido competitions. Uh, there's demonstrations. That's about it. And really, you're trying to neutralize your opponent, and you're trying to stop a fight or get away, uh, and not hurt somebody. So it's very funny. We have a very martial. One of our senseis is is really kind of martial and funny in that way intentionally funny in his martial martiality if that's even a word um and he'll say but we're but we're, we're good aikidoists so we won't take the opportunity to rip the person's spine out right now and instead we will gently like do this and and, and apply a pin but but here are the three things you could have done along the way and look how nasty they would have been and everybody kind of chuckles um and and that's what's happening right now in the public sphere so um I think that we, you know, we, we need to figure out how to be our own, how to pick up our own martial arts, how to step into the arena, say what we mean, be as present as we can be, harness our other modes of being, the way showed up a lot in this call today, uh, and bring those to the party as well, because they're equally important, um, and trying to figure out what to do. Uh, Mike, yeah, I, I'm really interested because for me, for a while, the, the Trump documents kerfluffle seemed to me to be a cheap way for Trump to get attention. And one of my uh, inferences from Trump, I have a, a whole thought in my brain about Trump's playbook, basically the, the tactics he loved to, loves to use. And there are many, many, many tactics he loves to use and is really good at using. And I thought that one of the, the, his main guidelines was attention is good. It doesn't matter if they're if they're hating on you. Like any airtime is really good. And if we were busy spending on, you know, I got classified documents and so forth. But it appears that he's gotten himself in some serious ass trouble with these documents. And this could actually be the the Al Capone kind of, you know, mm -hmm. Al Capone didn't go to prison for for uh, killing anybody. He went to prison for tax evasion. And uh, so don't never underestimate the National Archives and Records Administration. So uh, I'll hail Nara Lago uh, as this thing goes. Mark, did you want to jump in? As archivists, we're at the Internet Archive. We're thrilled that our arch archivists are going to take down Trump. We're just over the moon. Um, 
I was uh, watching a YouTube, John Dean predicts how Trump will react to redacted affidavit. And the first comment, at least when I had it open, was uh, by a man named Craig Dillon. I'll read it quickly. A big problem with all these analysts that try to put consistent reasoning to Trump's actions is that Trump does not think in a rationally consistent manner. That is why he will do things that are totally contradictory. He confuses everyone by doing that. That confusion is not really intentional, but it often seems planned and intentional. It puts everyone off their game. And I was thinking to myself, holy shit, with all the chaos that I've created, I'm the reverse Trump. I am doing things that people don't understand. And just because they don't understand doesn't mean that I don't understand, but there's a communication pathology. And I put people off their game by moving quickly and improving things secretly. And I really believe in improving things secretly because basically you don't get flack and people don't, people don't even notice. Um, and you just make, make things better and don't take credit and just, you know, move on um, without that communication uh, again, pathology that we're talking about so much about misunderstanding and and the hard hardness of people's hearts. Um, anyway, um, I thought that was a very interesting observation about you know Trump's actions. Um, they're not necessarily intentional. I don't think he's smart enough, but he's found a pattern that works for him. Uh, and Mark, your shamanic secret is safe with us. Um, and you just kind of triggered something for me where I have a, a funny long-standing debate with a, a, a couple of friends of ours on, on just using a word like intelligence with connect, connected to Donald Trump. And they're like, no, he's an idiot. He's dumb. And I'm like, he's done a lot of stuff that's smarter than you think. And so I just posted some links there to how smart is Trump, a video that I, that I posted some time ago after the 2016 election <clears throat> about saying that he's actually a lot smarter than we think. One tiny bit of evidence for me is Trump is a better caricature of the greedy billionaire than Thurston Howell III from Gilligan's Island. Mm -hmm. And that caricature, I think, is really intentional. The red long tie, the golden hair, the, 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 you know, the triffid on his head, the, the whole thing is like extremely intentional because the caricature actually is memorable and carries. And it's really hard to pay attention to the clown as a serious player. One of the reasons why he was able to wipe out 17 competitors in the, in the Republican primaries was that he was the clown that nobody took seriously until it was too late and he won the nomination. And he appears out of the mists, you know, at the Republican National Convention. Only I can, can, can fix this. Mm -hmm. Like, wow, that like he's, he, and he also thinks extremely long-term like a good mafia Don. The reason we can't pin him down now, the reason that Michael Cohen, his lawyer is like, he never says explicitly, go do this thing, go wipe out that thing, because that would be incriminating and that's evidence. And Roy Cohn, his coach and mentor, taught him not to do that. So he's really good at that discipline to the point where I've got a thought in my brain called crimes, crimes Trump has likely committed, mm -hmm. which involves an entire galaxy of, of interesting crimes that, that none of which so far have landed him in orange. And so, um, so anyway, there's a whole, you've opened a whole Pandora's box for me because I don't think he's stupid. And I think misunderestimating Donald Trump is extraordinarily dangerous, which is one reason why I stand on that topic of he's smarter than you think he is, beware, because he will bite. Uh, Rick, and then yeah. Gil. Yeah, just to dovetail on that, um, I mean, <laughs> Trump is a, an emotional savant to our amygdala and reptilian brains. I mean, he is a master of that. He's smart in that domain, but not at the neocortical level. But he knows how to whip the mob up and keep them transfixed in his trance. Anyway, that's a punctuation. I don't want to go on that too long because uh, it's not going to change quickly. But the one thing, as I was listening to people today, you know, I mean, certain words just stood out. There were a number of virtues that people spoke to, love, et cetera. Um, and one of the questions I put in there is, what are the constellation of virtues that we need to cultivate to ex for exponentiating ethical transformations? And one of the things that I, I feel that we don't do a good job as is differentiating between virtues and values. And we tend to mix them up. 
And as a, as a simple aphorism, I would say that uh, virtues align us, but values divide us. And if we don't make that distinction clear, then we are getting, uh, we get sucked into dysfunctional polarization. That's a, a very quick summary. I reckon I'm done speaking. Thanks, Rick. Uh, Gil. Yeah, nice quote on virtues and values, Rick. Thank you for that. Is that, is that yours or is that, we attribute that to you? Uh, I, I haven't found, if somebody else has made it up, it's a coincidence and I can attribute to the, <laughs> I don't I'll, know. I'll, I'll attribute it to you back on Trump real quickly. We've, we've marveled at how, how little anybody speaks of him as a mafia don and his family is a crime family because it's got all the characteristics of that i've been wondering for you know since 2016 why they aren't rolling rico out against him because it's classic in every way the other surprise there is that bloomberg in i guess it was 2017 said uh you know everybody in new york knows he's a crook nobody will do business with him because he doesn't pay anybody and i thought mike why didn't you say that during the campaign Absolutely. Well, not only that, but one of his tactics is basically Darbo accuse the other side of exactly what yes. you're doing. Yes. So there's an, there's an entire trope of the Biden crime family that that Trump and the the, the Trump delegates basically um, utter all the time, constantly. And it's like, it, and it takes and it takes a lot of balls to do that. It's a really, really kind of like out there kind of extreme thing to do. And Trump's followers love that about him. Well, the, he, he appears to be the, 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 like the gutsiest player in the arena. And it, some days I think he actually is. Well, and it's, it's, it's remarkable watching all his media acolytes pivot instantly every time the story changes. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, you know, the, the new script races through the Fox universe and everywhere else. Notably yesterday, who was it? Lawrence O'Donnell last night pointed this out uh, on MSNBC. Yesterday, after the release of the <laughs> Justice Department response and the photos, uh, the right wing media sphere was quiet for an entire day. I don't know if they're up, I don't know if they're figuring something out today, but they had nothing to say. Mm -hmm. Maybe the only time in the last four years that's happened. Well, what's happening now is Lindsey Graham is saying there will be violence in the streets. And, and it's like, well, huh, that's where they've gotten to. Like, there's no defense. But hey, if you actually go ahead and prosecute, we're gonna we're gonna riot and up and rise up. And I'm like, yeah, doesn't doesn't sound that sensible, but it's an and, 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 and if we don't prosecute in the face of threats of riots in the streets, it's game over. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> um, I'm shocked by his staying power. I keep thinking that he's going to suddenly like fall off the cliff or do whatever else and be gone, but he's still not gone. I'm worried that there are lots of people competing to out Trump Trump, like Ron DeSantis and others who are clearly making a performance art out of yeah. doing stuff that will attract attention in the same way so that they can be the younger, better, faster, sleeker, more modern uh, Trump and, and that the Trump ism will outlast the Trump, the Donald himself, which is too bad. And I'm also aware we're near the end of our call and I would love to end on something that isn't about the Trump apocalypse. Yeah, um, so, uh, Mike, Thanks, got it. Uh, well, I hate to disappoint you, but I was going to say something. Okay, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, you actually, it's, it's optimistic in a certain way. I like uh, that. Um, I think the thing about Trump that that explains something, if it's true, is that he. It, it's not that he's smart. It's not that he's dumb. It's not that he's like it's not that his gears are turning so much as that he has the total lack of super ego. N nothing in his brain ever says, ah, but I shouldn't do that. I shouldn't say that. I shouldn't, there's no, there's no centering force. So he'll do contradictory thing, anything that crosses his mind, any urge, any it, you know, he's just nothing but it. And you can't fake that. And so nobody else will ever be another Trump. I mean, I don't, I don't know if I've ever seen in public life somebody who, who just, you know, I mean, he'll tell one lie one day and an opposite lie the next day and just like never, you know, how can he say that? How can he do that? Because there's no part of his brain that feels guilty, that wants to apologize. I mean, he says he never apologizes, won't apologize. 
he, he has no superego. So it's a strange mutation that I, I've never seen anybody else pull off, but but I think people are are sort of drawn to God, what would it be like not to not to self-censor in any way, just to do whatever or any urge, you know, wanted me to do. So that's that's a quasi-optimistic take on him <laughs> and others. Michael, I'm, I mostly agree with you, but I just want to point out that he has an, ex an exquisitely tuned internal governance mechanism in the sense of if you're a mafia don, there's a bunch of stuff you want to never say or do. Mm -hmm. There's a bunch of, of places you do not want to go because that leaves evidence in a trail or whatever else. Uh, and so, so you don't go there. That's some kind of internal governance mechanism. Then I want to add to that, that many people say that Trump has a really weak ego. I'm like, nobody with a weak ego would have survived the 2016 electoral campaign. Uh, he was, I saw some of the world's best humor applied against him viscerally. Uh, he, uh, you know, and he, he survives and he sort of somehow feeds off of being hated. Um, and he understands the dynamic of this combat better than just about anybody else. He, in the 2016 campaign, I saw that he understood the, the, the dynamics of modern media better than any other player on stage. He, he just was a complete master of it. And everybody else, including Hillary, was clueless, just hopeless, like, like hapless, I think is the word maybe. Um, so anyway, uh, I, so, I'm, so I'm agreeing with your premise, but I, I just want to fold in that he, to me, he appears to have lots of self-control in a weird way, in the way a Mafia Don has to have self-control. Only about written records. But that's really big. Uh, well, no yeah, written records, and no, but also what he tells Michael Cohen, he's like, yeah, you know, it'd be a shame if somebody ha something happened to his car. It, it's different. It's different from, hey, go put out a hit on this guy, <laughs> right? And, and and to do that consistently for all these years, I've been following. Um, oh, someone has had a really good. Jennifer Taub has had a brilliant thread on Twitter for the last couple of days where she's going through the crimes Trump has committed. I'll post a link to the thread uh, reader uh, thread of it. And she's going way, way back to the Taj Mahal, to all sorts of things before that, to like, like, and before he was elected, I read The Making of Donald Trump, I think it was called by David K. Johnson, an excellent investigative reporter. I'm like, how, how is anybody going to vote for a guy who's been sued 4,000 times and treats people like shit so much? And that forced me to think about what's appealing about that kind of character in this kind of time. Anyway, we're still talking about Trump. Mark, uh, you're muted. Ah, go ahead. Hopefully this will be the last. There's a joke and I love the power of ridicule and insight that comes from jokes, mm -hmm. good humor. So Trump goes into the Trump Tower gets on his elevator all the way to where he's, you know, got the top floor of this, that, and the other. And right before the door closes, this statuesque blonde woman slithers in to the elevator. It's just Trump and this woman. The woman goes, Donald, I've been watching for many, many years. I really, really want to give you a blowjob. And Trump goes, mm. What's in it for me? I like, all right. Um, let me read us a poem to take us out that has nothing to do with Donald Trump. Please. It's one of, my, one of my favorite poems in the world by Robert Francis called Summons. It's pretty optimistic as you will see, and it goes like this. Keep me from going to sleep too soon. Or if I go to sleep too soon, come wake me up. Come any hour of night, come whistling up the road, stomp on the porch, bang on the door, make me get out of bed and come and let you in and light a light. Tell me the Northern lights are on and make me look or tell me clouds are doing something to the moon they never did before. And show me, see that I see. Talk to me till I'm half as wide awake as you and start to dress wondering why I ever went to bed at all. Tell me the walking is superb. Not only tell me, but persuade me. You know I'm not too hard to persuade.
Um, thank you very much for a lovely, lovely call. Um, Pete, thanks for posting the, the Jennifer Tobbs thread. That's fabulous. Uh, completely worthwhile reading, even if it's a little slow going because she's busy narrating her days and breaks and classes and everything else along the way, but it's, it's quite amusing. Uh, but thank you all. Everybody. <laughs>